Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Simon, Superintendent of Schools for the East Greenbush Central School District, and I'm pleased that you've taken an opportunity this evening to join us via Zoom to hear about the proposed plan for opening our schools in September. I'm joined this evening by a number of our administrative members of our team. I'd like to take just a moment to introduce each and each one of them, and then we will proceed with a about a 30 minute presentation and then a question and answer session facilitated through thought exchange. Uh, we have each of the elementary principals from the five respective K-5 schools. I wanna start by introducing Mrs. Helen Scalacci, who is the principal of the Red Mill Elementary School. We have Mr. Wayne Grignan, who is the principal of the Janae Elementary School. Mr. Dan Garib, principal of Green Meadow Elementary School and Mr. Marty Mahar, the principal of Bell Top School. So we're pleased that each of our elementary principals have joined us for this topic discussion regarding our elementary plan. Additionally, we have members of our central office administrative team. Oh, I left off Mr. Alvey, he's at the bottom of the screen. And we also have the distinguished veteran principal of the Donald P. Southern and Elementary School, Mr. Alvey. Right? And I apologize that I left him off. He was at the bottom of the screen, so. Uh, I know that he is standing out there in front of DPS monitoring the school construction project right now. Joined with us from the central office team is our director of business and finance, Linda Wager, our assistant director of pupil personnel services, Kara Harrington, our director of human resources, Marissa Cannon, and helping us with the technology and the connectivity to each and every one of you is Mark Adam, our Public Information Specialist, and Peter Goodwin, our Director of Technology. As parents, I know that you are eager to learn about what will be happening in the schools this year. Uh, we wanna take an opportunity over the next 30 minutes to talk to you about the plans. Before we move into the specifics, we wanna explain what has been happening over the summer and as we've been preparing for this school year, what considerations exist as we move forward? Uh, in the spring of last school year, we were able to make adjustments to our plan to facilitate the kindergartners through the fifth grade students all coming into school in person. That was a challenge that, and over the course of the school year, as the situation with COVID-19 got better, and the regulations changed, we were able to complete our school year on a high note. Although we recognize that it was challenging for our parents, challenging for our students and challenging for our staff, including our teachers and our support employees, but we did it. In the spring, uh, we were looking at a very optimistic situation regarding COVID-19, a uh, number of uh, people within our school district community participating in vaccination. Uh, the infection rate had declined to about 0.3 on a seven day rolling average. And we held high aspirations for a fairly normalized school year. We still hold those high aspirations, despite the fact that the Delta variant has become a concern to all of the communities across our country and our state our plans that we roll forward to you this evening are intended to ensure that all of our children, kindergarten through 12th grade, have an opportunity this year to participate in five days of full in-person instruction. We have also worked with our Board of Education to provide additional supports and services to students to help our students transition back to full in-person learning. And we will be talking about all of these plans this evening. At this time, I'm going to share my screen and I will begin our formal presentation. And I'm hoping that our panel can give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Very good. Our objective this year is to ensure that all of our children, kindergarten through 12th grade, can come into our classrooms five days a week to be engaged in in-person learning and that we maintain 
the opportunity for our students to be learning in person. Our plans this year will not include a hybrid model and the district will not be offering a full remote choice for our students. We do have an option that is available for those students that are medically qualified to receive remote learning and we will talk about that during the presentation. Our goal is to make sure that we re-engage all of our children in our classrooms and we engage our community in continuing the excellent education that we provide in East Greenbush. Our plans are based on the guidelines provided by the CDC, based on the American Academy of Pediatrics and the New York State Education Department. We've been working through Questar Three BOCES and all of the school districts in our region to put together a regional plan that is consistent for all of our schools in our area. Those plans may vary slightly based on the size of the school, the configuration of the school district. However, in terms of our health and safety protocols, we are all working together to have consistent guidance. We're doing so because it wasn't until August 5th that we were informed that the New York State Department of Health would not provide any guidance or regulations for our schools as they, have, as they had done last year. In addition, the transition of the governorship has impacted our timing and our ability to roll these plans out earlier. However, we believe and have confidence in that the plan that we are out to you tonight will be very similar to the plan that we implement. The only thing that might change is with our new governor, we may be receiving within a short period of time state guidance from the Department of Health. We will review that guidance. And if there are any changes that we make, we will make those changes and we will advise our community. Where we sit right now as a school district, in Rensselaer County, the infection rate is 4.3% on a seven-day rolling average as of today. We are classified as being, by the CDC, as being located within a high transmission zone. Virtually all of the counties in New York State are considered to be in a high transition zone. We are encouraged by the level of participation in vaccinations within our county, with approximately 68.9% of our county residents 18 and older who are eligible to be vaccinated are vaccinated. Additionally, those students between the ages of 12 and 17 who are eligible to be vaccinated, 67.4%. So Rensselaer County is doing a good job of working with the community to ensure that those, in, those interested in becoming vaccinated have access. Our strategies will look very similar to what was in place last school year. In some cases, we are modifying our strategies to be compliant with the CDC recommendations. This year, we will continue to do temperature checks on a daily basis. Those temperature checks will include new equipment that we have purchased to facilitate the students coming in to school. We have uh, purchased the uh, thermal scanning machines that we've been utilizing at the middle school and the high school. Those machines have not arrived as of yet, but in the event that they don't arrive in time for September 9th, we will continue to do the handheld temperature checks. Masking has become a controversial topic within our state and across our country. We recognize that individuals have varying views regarding masking. However, in accordance with the CDC guidance and the recommendation of the State Education Department and our new governor's announcement just the other day that the state will look at a universal masking policy for schools, all of our students, all of our staff and employees will be wearing masks in school, regardless of vaccination status. We make that decision because we recognize that as a district, we need to adhere to the standards that are established by the CDC and our state education department. Additionally, you may recall last year that one of the encroachments on our ability to be able to have all of our students in every day was the six foot social distancing rule. In accordance with CDC, we can now have our classrooms, our students located within those classrooms, three feet apart. 
In some cases, the distance will be three feet. In other cases, it may be a little bit more based on classroom design and classroom space. The cleaning and disinfecting practices that were in place and in accordance with the CDC will continue with the exception at the middle school and the high school. It is no longer required that we clean and disinfect desks while students transition from one class to another in between classes. That practice will uh, no longer be in place. However, the daily cleaning and disinfecting of both our buses and our classrooms will continue to occur. We will continue to encourage everybody within our school community to practice the good practices of hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette that we've been talking about and employing over the last couple of years. The uh, ability of the district to ensure that the screening is done every day uh, with the number of students that are coming in uh, to school every day with full occupancy. We're going to rely on the parents to simply make sure that your students are not indicating any symptoms of COVID-19. We won't be requiring parents to do the screening instrument, the app, and we will not be requiring our employees to do that, but we're relying on everybody's goodwill and understanding of the issues associated with COVID-19 to screen for symptoms every day and make sure that if students are sick or employees are sick, that they stay home. We are working with the county. The county has received a $3.8 million grant to support the implementation of strategies within our schools to ensure that we remain fully open. Those strategies include the implementation of testing. That particular plan is not in place as of yet. We don't anticipate that testing will be a component of our schools immediately in September. The county has not received final approval for the implementation of the grant, which would include the purchase of testing materials and testing equipment. At this time, testing would be based on consent and we would be required to test up to 10% of our student population every week to ensure that we have readily available data on the potential for infection spread within our student population. You will hear more about the testing programs as the county finalizes its plans and we work within the region to implement testing as an important mitigation strategy. Face masks must include either a cloth mask or a surgical mask and face masks must be worn covering both the mouth and the nose. And this is being required of all students, staff and visitors to the school, including on school buses, again, regardless of vaccination status. We are asking those individuals who are vaccinated to wear a mask because in accordance with the data that we have received from Rensselaer County, approximately 30% of the new cases that Rensselaer County is responding to are what's considered breakthrough cases. People who have been fully vaccinated who are getting COVID-19 Delta variant. So we believe that the safest policy is to implement the CDC and New York State Education Department regulations and ensure that everybody wears a mask. As we monitor the infection rate within our community and as the state and the county provide additional guidance, and we may continue to evaluate this policy and make adjust adjustments where permitted. Again, the governor has indicated that she is exploring a statewide mask mandate. We will not permit bandanas or neck gaiter style masks to be used in school. We wanna be consistent about the type of mask that everyone is wearing within our school community. Students will be provided mask breaks when seated in class and socially distanced, and we'll talk about how that will work in just a little bit. And masks are optional when the students are outdoors and any visitors to our schools are outdoors. Our classrooms will be set up with three feet of physical distancing. Given our class sizes this year, which are relatively modest and small in some cases, all of our classrooms can service students at three feet. All of our schools are also able to fully comply with the guidance to ensure that all of our academic programs 
can be delivered at the kindergarten through fifth grade level. Last year, as we began the school year, we completed a study of the indoor air quality within each of our school buildings through a contract with TRAIN, which is an HVAC and energy management company. Improvements were made to ventilation, including the implementation of a purge program, which enables the district to bring more fresh air into our classrooms than what is typically required by New York State regulations. Additionally, we continue to run exhaust fans 24 seven to ensure that we are continually recycling the air, pushing out potentially contaminated air and bringing in fresh air. We have taken steps to repair and replace faulty exhaust fans within all of our unit ventilators and within our systems, and we have upgraded our air filters. We continue to work in this area because ventilation has been identified as a key to ensure that we reduce and mitigate the impact potential impact of COVID-19. Our regular and cleaning and disinfecting of our school building buses will continue, including with high touch areas. Based on the CDC recommendations, we will not need to clean the desks between classes at the high school and the middle school, but that will be done at least once a day. And we will make sure that in the event that there is an incident in which we identify someone with COVID-19, we will thoroughly clean and disinfect the affected classrooms and or office areas, and we have available outside services if necessary to make sure that we're able to do a thorough deep cleaning and disinfecting in those cases. Transportation guidance has changed. School transportation guidance includes consistency with all mass transit uh, across the state and at the federal level. We are no longer restricted by having social distancing on the bus. All students and staff, however, need to wear a face mask while riding the school bus, regardless of vaccination status. So every child on the bus, the bus driver, and in the case where we have a bus aid, everyone will need to wear their masks and those masks will need to be remained on while students are on the bus, covering both the nose and the mouth. Windows and roof hatches will be open as long as weather permits to provide as much ventilation on the bus as is available. And the cleaning and disinfecting will continue on the bus between runs every day as we did last year. Cafeteria. CDC guidance indicates that schools should distance students as much as possible to ensure that we can continue to serve lunch to all the children. Spacing as the students are coming into the cafeteria and through the service line and spacing while seated. There is no six feet rule that we need to abide by during lunch. In most cases at the elementary school, we will be at least three feet, if not more. Uh, and, and I say in most cases, because in some cases it will be more, but it is a minimum of three feet, uh, depending on the number of students within that particular grade level and lunch period and the number of lunch periods that need to operate. Individual seating will be maintained for lunch. While we, we wish we could have our students sitting at tables together, interacting and having the kind of downtime that they would typically enjoy based on the guidance and our desire to make sure that we don't have a situation of COVID-19 spread within lunch, students will remain at individual seating. Students will be facing the same way. Students will be permitted to take their masks off while eating and drinking. We anticipate that lunch will be provided within about 15 minutes, which is the guidance from CDC to try to have the students eat within 15 minutes and put their mask off. That 15 minutes is an important measure in terms of ensuring that students are not subject to a quarantine in the event that they are sitting near or in proximity to someone who is identified with. COVID-19. We also continue to provide appropriate ventilation in all of our areas of the cafeteria. For athletics, doesn't necessarily relate to the elementary school, but we may have some high school and middle school parents. Within the CDC guidance, the district is required to take a look at what we can do to ensure that we can offer high-risk sports. Uh, 
CDC guidance indicates that sports such as football, volleyball, and cheer are considered to be more at risk of spread for COVID-19. And when we are operating within a high-risk transmission zone, there are certain requirements that we need to be mindful of. Under the CDC guidance, not only is um, testing recommended, it is something that we have decided to implement. So we are implementing mandatory testing of our players who are involved in higher risk sports. I'm happy to report that the first testing was done today on the JV and the varsity football program, and we had no positive cases. And this was our first run at testing all of the student athletes in one of our sports. We will also have voluntary surveillance testing for students who participate in moderate sports, such as soccer, and field hockey, those testing, that testing will begin in mid-September. Parent and guardian consent forms are required if students are to be tested. This year, we will not be implementing spectator limits unless otherwise directed by the state or the section two. Contact tracing, however, will have to occur in the event that we do have someone who attends one of our games or contests, becomes positive for COVID-19, and we will be using this year a convenient way for our parents and our spectators to access a QR code on their phone and to fill out a form indicating that they were in attendance at that event. They can do that ahead of time. Indoor sports will still require a face mask. That will include girls volleyball and boys volleyball. And I was over at the gym today at Columbia High School. The girls were practicing and every single one of them had their masks on and they were doing a great job. In music, the ability of our district to ensure that all of our kids can participate in music is as important and equitable when we talk about participation in extracurricular activities, including music and athletics and the arts and the science clubs. For general music, chorus and orchestra, our students will continue to wear masks and maintain three feet of social distancing. We have, we have discussed this issue with other school districts who have as many students in those programs. Based on a study that was done last year, we believe that as long as the students are wearing masks while singing and while playing wind instruments, we will have all of our students ensure that their instruments are covered, the horns are covered with bell covers, which is basically a mask for your musical instrument that reduces the uh, significantly the level of uh, potential aerosol spread of COVID-19. Additionally, where permitted by weather, we would encourage some of our musical groups to rehearse outside. Physical education will remain at six feet social distancing. And again, as we begin September and October, and, and again in the spring, when weather permits, we will have the kids outside for physical education activities. And the curriculum has been adjusted to ensure that we can do that. School procedures at the elementary school, we are encouraging students to ride the bus. You recall last year that in several of our schools, uh, due to the concern regarding the busing, our parent drop off traffic was quite extensive. And in some cases, the traffic was backed up into some of our major, thir major thoroughfares, such as Route 4. Uh, we want to ensure that parents are dropped off Parents are dropping their kids off at the times that our uh, supervision is available and the principals are communicating that in each of their buildings to the parents. Students will have their temperature checks when arriving in the schools. Masks will be required at all times in the building. Desks will be separated by three feet. Students may remove their masks for meals and snacks and mask breaks when socially distanced. During snack time, snack will occur on a rotation plan where each row, every other row of students will have a snack, then they'll put their mask on, and then we'll do the alternate rows so that in the event that there is a case, all of the students in the class would be a minimum of socially distanced three feet with their masks on. Students will be provided up to three mask breaks per day for no longer than 10 minutes. In some cases, those mask breaks might be more. It's a minimum of three mask breaks per day. Markers will be provided within our hallways and our special area instruction rooms 
such as our library, our gymnasium, to ensure that we are always mindful of the need to be a minimum of three feet from each other. We already talked about physical education. We talked about the cafeterias. We want to talk a little bit about the contact tracing. Contact tracing is the process which the county implements in collaboration with the school district to ensure that in the event that they are notified of a student or a staff member who is positive for COVID-19, we can identify those individuals who are around that person to ensure that we don't uh, that we know who that is and that we take appropriate steps to ensure that we reduce the likelihood of infection spread. Under CDC guidelines, there is an exception for students, which is important to keep our kids in class. In the K-12 classroom setting, a close contact excludes any students who are within three to six feet of an infected student, as long as both the infected student and the exposed student were consistently wearing their masks. So if a child is identified as positive with COVID-19 and your child was sitting at a desk right next to them, as long as both of those students were wearing a mask, your child would not need to be quarantined. Additionally, we will be providing alternative instruction in the event that students are quarantined by a county health department order. At the middle school and high school, we will continue the live streaming but only for those students who are quarantined as a result of a county order. At the elementary school level, we will provide tutoring and access to assignments. That tutoring would most likely occur after typical school hours. However, we also have other support programs that we're putting in place for additional tutoring in the event that that is needed. We, as I mentioned earlier, we are working with Quest Arboses in Rensselaer County to implement a testing program. That program is not finalized as of yet. That program will involve two types of testing, surveillance testing, which is voluntary testing programs to make sure that the, we have the data on potential community spread to help identify asymptomatic cases. Additionally, should students develop symptoms at school, we may be able to test students at school with the consent of the parent to rule out COVID-19. And we are using the antigen rapid tests, which take about 15 minutes to get the result. We will talk more about testing as we proceed in the school year. We do offer a limited full remote option for those students that are medically qualified. There's an application form that is available on our website, which requires information from your child's primary care provider. That application form will be reviewed by our district's medical director, Dr. Kevin Albert, to consider whether or not your child would be approved for this option. Under this option, the programs will be provided directly by Questar 3 higher teachers. They will not be East Greenbush teachers who currently are employed within our school district. We wanna emphasize the importance of everyone coming back in person. We have hired additional teachers to support students who may need additional reading and math services. We have hired additional social workers to help students and families transition. Those students who need help and support, we have that support available. We also are focusing on engagement of students. We're going to have after school activities and programs for all of the kids at the elementary school level, which will likely start around October 1st, including academic support help, student interest clubs, and fun activities if the students want to stay after school. That program will be staffed by East Greenbush teachers. Additionally, as we work to put together our calendar for the year, we're hoping that we can maintain as many in-person events as possible, including welcome back events. We are looking at options related to parent conferences. With the feedback that we received last year from both parents and teachers was that the parent conference participation was higher as a result of providing conferences through virtual uh, and remote, we want to continue that practice. But we also want to provide an opportunity should a parent request an in-person conference to be able to facilitate that. Outside groups for now will be able to use our facilities as long as those groups adhere to our 
health and safety protocols, and wear face masks. Face masks will not be required, however, at outdoor events. We are encouraging families who have children who are age eligible to receive the vaccine to consult with their child's primary care provider about the vaccine. And uh, we hope that over time, all of the mitigation strategies, including vaccines, will keep our students, our staff members, our parents and our community members safe as we look forward to what we know will be a great school year. We will continue to communicate with all of you, our families, our staff, and our community members. If anything changes, we ask that you communicate with us. We want to be aware of situations that may be occurring with your child. And we ask you to communicate as early as possible with an opportunity for us to address the problem. Student engagement in both the classroom and extracurricular activities is extremely important this year. It's important every year, but even more so as our students are transitioning from some of the remote learning last year. We will be focusing on attendance. We have staff available to assist students and families who may be having challenges related to daily attendance in school. We've increased the level of academic support and social emotional support within our school, including additional social work help and additional tutors and AIS teachers. We want to be flexible and respond to the changes in the infection rate and any further guidance that we get. And we ask you to communicate at the appropriate level where the individual is most able to solve your problem. So if there's an issue going on with your child's instruction, we encourage you to contact the teacher. We hope that our teachers will work with you to solve the problem. If we're not able to solve the problem, we ask you to call one of our principals or send them an email or her an email and they will intervene and try to assist. If that is not successful, then you can call me or members of our central administration and then you always have the option to communicate with our board of education. Our timelines include, we are here tonight, talking about school opening with our elementary parents. We will have another meeting on Monday for our middle school parents and on Tuesday, our staff is reporting on Tuesday to begin professional development and planning for the year. And we'll have a meeting that evening with our high school parents. And the first day of instruction will be Thursday, September 9th. And we're really looking forward to welcoming the kids back. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Adam. I went a little bit longer, about 37 minutes. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Adam to begin the question and answer period. Thank you, Mr. Simons. So I will share my screen. And as Mr. Adam is doing that, we've been joined by our Director of Transportation, who supervises our busing, Mr. Mark Noeth. Welcome, Mark. All right, Mr. Simons, do you see the thought exchange screen with the nine digit code? I certainly do, Mr. Adam. All right, so we will be conducting a Q&A through thought exchange. This is a crowdsourcing a platform that we use. Um, we included a link on our website so that you could submit your questions during the presentation. But at this time, you can also visit tejoin.com and type in the nine digit code you see on your screen and you'll be able to ask a question or write a comment. And um, the question we've posed is, as we approach the new school year, what are your key questions and concerns regarding our preliminary opening plans? So and I will just you, start. Go ahead, Mr. Adam, I apologize. Sure, I started the timer there. So you have a couple minutes. If you haven't had a chance, you can write a question. Once you submit that, you can also rank the thoughts of others so that we can address the most popular questions.
All right, we're starting to get some thoughts in the thought exchange, so we can go ahead and start addressing these through the panel. Um, feel free to continue to write your questions and submit them. We'll keep this open for a little while as we go. First question, will teachers keep their classroom windows open every day, including winter days? Uh, not likely during the winter days. Uh, there are times when they may open the windows. Uh, the fresh air program that we have, the purge program, uh, should be sufficient to ensure the level of fresh air within the room uh, is appropriate. And part of the IAQ program that we have indoor air quality program we have continues to push the bad air off bad air out. So uh, rooms are required by New York State to be kept at a certain temperature. Uh, we have to be mindful of that requirement and we also are exceeding the New York State requirements to bring fresh air in. We've also purchased for our nurse's office uh, air purification units uh, that we believe will assist in making sure, particularly in the nurse's office spaces, where there is more potential for someone to be there who uh, indic is indicating symptoms of COVID-19, that th that additional equipment will help to purify the air. We had a similar question on ventilation. Um, can you explain the purge air ventilation program? Does that include fresh air being brought into the building throughout the day? It does include it throughout the day, but it also includes turning all of the motors on at higher speed and opening up the dampers during the hours prior to student arrival and staff arrival in the morning, and then immediately at the end of the day after the students are dismissed. The speed of the motor, as I understand it, is turned down a little bit during the day because of noise distraction and other issues within our classrooms. But the idea is to bring as much fresh air when the building, prior to the building being open for students and staff and being occupied and to push as much poor air out both during the day and really accelerate that process after school. Opening up all the dampers, making sure that the uh, exhaust fans are running on high and making sure that the unit ventilators are functioning properly. Is there a plan in place if schools are required to shut down? Uh, we, are, we are discussing that uh, within our district. It would most likely look similar to what we had to do last year. Uh, that plan would include, in some cases, if you have a classroom, for example, that the county indicates had a high level of exposure and we needed to shift that class to full remote as we did in some cases last year. For example, I know we did that at Red Mill. At one point, uh, we have the capacity to shift to full remote to remain uh, connected with the kids and to provide continuity of instruction. We're hoping that that doesn't happen. Again, we want to emphasize uh, full in-person learning, but in the event that we are required to do that because of a county order or in the event, event that we have uh, a number of student, students absent or staff members absent affected by COVID-19, we are prepared to shift to remote instruction. I'm concerned that a student must have a doctor's note to return to school if exhibiting COVID-like symptoms. Can a student return with a negative test only? We are still looking at that process. Again, New York State Department of Health did not provide specific regulations. Last year, you may recall a flow chart that required the, in order for a student to return to school, they needed to either have a negative COVID test resolution of symptoms or an alternative diagnosis. Uh, in this case, the CDC guidance this year is a little more general. Uh, in some instances, a COVID negative test would be required. In other instances, we may want to have more information on uh, from your child's primary care provider as to what's happening. And we're still ironing out that process um, in accordance with CDC. Guidance. Are you letting parents know that if someone in the child's class tested positive? Uh, we are bound by 
uh, confidentiality related to student health information. We would certainly let people know if we have a positive case uh, in a particular school, at a particular grade level, in the event that your child is identified as a close contact, you would be counted, you would be contacted by the County Department of Health. They would inform you of that. They would determine uh, recommendations that you uh, would need to follow. So we won't be sharing with parents who the child is, but we'll be providing sufficient information for you to know that there was a case in the school uh, and what the impact might be in terms of the number of students that might be subject to quarantine as we did last year. We're hoping that that number will be much smaller given the, um, given the steps that we're taking as a district and also the exemption of students that I talked about earlier who are sitting in class with masks on wouldn't necessarily be quarantined. How do you prevent someone wearing a flimsy cloth mask or a mask uh, just covering the mouth? I've noticed even adults wearing masks only covering the mouth in the school. Uh, we've talked to our faculty and staff today. We had faculty and staff meetings today at both the elementary school level and the middle and high school level. We spoke to them about the importance of enforcing consistent mask expectations for both the adults in the school and the children. Uh, we reminded staff of everyone's responsibility to ensure that we are role models and we are wearing those masks properly. Additionally, we will be reminding students if they are wearing their masks uh, in a way that is not consistent with our protocols. We also will have masks available in the event that masks uh, rip, get dirty, uh, need to be changed. We have ordered a number of child size, children size masks that will be available in all of the schools and those will be the disposable masks. So through all those steps, we hope that everybody will be wearing their masks appropriately, covering their nose and mouth. And as little children often need, we will need reminders and sometimes our adults need reminders. So we're all gonna work together on this. Will contact tracing happen in classroom and cafeteria? Yes, in accordance with what the county directs us to do. Um, last year, this happened on a number of instances. Uh, this is a good opportunity for those of you I know who were involved in some of those incidents last year to talk a little bit about how that process worked. And I'm gonna call on Mr. Grignan because I recall a couple of situations where he was in that cafeteria looking at seating charts and identifying who was sitting where, what way they were turned and who was next to who and Mr. Grignan has a good handle on this process. So I'm gonna call on Mr. Grignan. Thank you, Mr. Simons. So to answer the question, um, you pretty much summed it right up um, in the classroom and also in the cafeteria and also with the related services such as speech, uh, OT, PT, um, all teachers will be required to have a seating chart that will be submitted to the main offices that way we can contact trace and the need for notified that there is a uh, positive case or a potential case that we're waiting for confirmation of just so we can be prepared. And we take that information and we will speak to the classroom teachers or the related service per personnel and get everything ready and then we'll submit it to, um, to Mr. Simon so he is aware and then the a communication will be coming shortly thereafter from the district notifying them. Or I'm sorry, notifying the school community. Thank you, Mr. Grignan. Any of our elementary principals have anything additional to add? Okay, but yes, contact tracing will occur in all instances, including the bus. Will an outdoor option be utilized for classroom instruction or lunch in order to get the children more fresh air? Uh, at this point, as we did last year at DPS, we were, last year at DPS, we needed to utilize a tent for outdoor dining for our fifth graders and it worked really well. But given the requirements this year and the changes, in addition to the number of students that we need to serve in the cafeteria, we don't really need to use a formalized scheduled lunch outside for any particular grade level in any particular building. However, many activities will occur when the weather permits 
outside, including encouraging our teachers to bring the kids outdoors. I'm gonna ask Mr. Mahar uh, to share a little bit about uh, some of the types of activities that uh, I know go on at Belltop uh, to bring the kids outside, engage the kids, not only in fun and recreation, but also learning. Yes, thank you, Mr. Simons. Um, this was utilized quite a bit at our school. Teachers asked permission to bring their students right outside the building. On a lot of cases, they were close enough to bring their Chromebooks and still connect to Wi-Fi, and they were socially distanced. Um, physical education, as much as they possibly could, use the outdoors instead of indoor activities. Um, and even a few times our music uh, teacher brought the students out, especially for those activities where they had to be uh, socially distanced more than six feet. It worked well. Obviously, we couldn't do it on rainy days or in the real cold, <clears throat> but um, we plan on following through with that again. Thank you. Very good. How about Mr. Alvey? Outdoor activities that uh, uh, come to mind in regard to last year? Actually, Mr. Mahar summed it up pretty well with, uh, you know, just some of the different things. We, we saw the, the same thing at DPS where, um, uh, especially in the nicer weather where our classroom teachers were taking students outside, um, utilizing the Wi-Fi that was reachable. Uh, one of the things that we started to do towards the end of the year to start to build school community as well was have um, our outdoor uh, assemblies, our monthly character education assemblies. We're able to uh, utilize our uh, backyard and our hill for our final uh, two assemblies in May and June. So um, we definitely try to take advantage of, of the, the outdoor space. Thank you, Mr. Alley. Mr. Garib, anything to add? Uh, well, I think my two colleagues added quite a bit there, but we also do try to have uh, snack outside when we can. Uh, we also had a very generous donor last year donate a large number of clipboards. Uh, so, you know, not only using the Chromebooks outside, uh, but doing some more traditional work uh, outside on the clipboards. And I think that's something you'll see stick around even hopefully post COVID. We've got a lot of positive feedback uh, about the outdoor learning from our staff and our students. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Scalacci. Uh, I can think of a, a few fun things that we did last spring in our ABC countdown days. We had um, a big school-wide tie-dyeing event outside in our courtyard, and that was a lot of fun for the students. And we also have a parent who's a DJ, and he came and played music outside, and we had an outdoor dance party. <laughs> um, so, you know, as far as instructional, I saw many of our younger grade teachers bringing out the students with their yoga mats to sit outside and do work um, outside or their beach towels in the nicer weather. So we'll plan on doing that this year as well. Thank you all. I appreciate those examples. Will there be any restrictions if family leaves the state during a school break? At this time, I have not we have not received any regulations regarding any travel advisories that could potentially impact families or employees. I remember last year that there was a, there were a number of executive orders that impacted travel, requiring people that came back from other states to have to be quarantined uh, or who traveled restrictions of traveling outside the country. At this point. Again, New York State Department of Health and the executive's office, the governor's office, though the, that's where those mandates came from. We do not have any mandates of that nature at all right now, including no group size restrictions. We just have to be careful and follow social distancing. Will the break schedules stay the same? How about snow days? Uh, at this point, the calendar has been released. Uh, we anticipate that the calendar will remain the same unless something happens at the state level. So our, everything from Columbus Day to our holiday recess to our February break to our spring break is on our calendar right now, and we don't anticipate anything that would impact that. We will begin the year in the winter with traditional snow days, uh, and we are currently discussing some options for remote learning that might preserve the number of days within the calendar in the event that we get to a certain point and we're in jeopardy of losing uh, or exceeding the number of snow days, but we haven't made any final determinations. So the good news for the kids is they will have some traditional snow days if it snows <laughs> and 
Um, we're looking at options that might preserve the days uh, and not, for example, have to adjust spring break or those other Memorial Day weekends uh, in the event that we get to three or four days where we've had to do an emergency closing. But we won't be doing, we won't need to do um, the required number of uh, remote days that we did last year to preserve the state requirements. Why is busing this year not required to be socially distant, just like our classrooms have to be? The CDC has made a determination over the course of really over the last year that um, their standards uh, needed to be adjusted in order to ensure that students could participate in full in-person learning. Um, there were, were lots of discussions across the country about the impact of remote learning, not being able to come into class and some of the transportation restrictions. There was lots of evidence across the New York State schools, including our own, that there were very little, if any, issues of transmission of COVID-19 from a student to a student on a bus or from a student to a bus driver or a bus aide. In fact, in our district, while we did have cases of contact tracing that impacted students who were quarantined because there was a student on the bus, there was no evidence that any infection spread occurred as a result of students riding the bus. So CDC adjusted this, A, in the interest of making sure that the kids could get to school, B, based on the data that indicated very low, if any, transmission spread on our school buses. It was really the ventilation and the cleaning and disinfecting that was uh, the primary, were the primary mitigating factors. Mr. Noah, do you have anything to add on that? I, th I think you covered it very well, Mr. Simons. Um, the cleaning and disinfecting really made a difference for last year, and we plan on continuing. Um, I will add that the students are very good about wearing their face masks, and uh, there was very little trouble with uh, students not wearing them properly. Um, so we'll continue our cleaning, our disinfecting, and the students will wear the mask, and uh, we'll stay the course. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. What will happen if young students can't finish lunch in 15 minutes, kindergarten, kindergartners specifically, will there be extra snack time? Yeah. I think we're very flexible about that. Uh, our, it's an aspirational goal based on our desire to try to keep kids from being quarantined. I'll ask, uh, I'll go back to Mr. Grignan who's nodding his head. Uh, I know that Mr. Grignan and all of our principals are very flexible and our staff to make sure that students aren't going to go hungry because they were didn't have enough time to eat lunch and I'll ask them to comment a little bit about snack time. Sure thanks Mr. Simons. Um, typically kindergartners usually have the first lunch in our buildings um, which allows them to have a little extra time to be able to finish lunch before the next grade level or the yeah before the next grade level comes in and even if a child is um, needing to have extra time to finish their lunch which we typically do encourage them they can either go outside and finish their lunch outside, um, or they can stay in the cafeteria and finish, and then our monitors will take this outside and meet the rest of the group afterwards. Okay, any other elementary principals want to comment? Yeah, we, Mr. Simons, just to say that uh, we do the pretty much the same exact thing that Mr. Grignan does at Janae, um, and I know the teachers also give them um, ample time to have snack during another portion of the day. Very good, All right. Thank you, Mr. Mahar. Thank you, Mr. Grignan. Are parents allowed to volunteer at the kindergarten and first grade level? Uh, yes, we are permitting volunteers. Uh, we will uh, be coordinating that in a way to be mindful of the number of adults in the classrooms with kids at any one time. We appreciate the parents helping us out and wanting to volunteer in our classrooms. Uh, we would expect parents to uh support us and we also will follow the same guidance as parent for parent volunteers uh as everyone in the school so yes we are resuming parent volunteering particularly in our youngest grades where that is really appreciated by teachers and staff alike, sports staff alike 
Mr. Simons, the meeting was scheduled to end at 730, but we do have some additional questions if you'd like to go through some more. Uh, as long as uh, folks are willing to hang on with me, I'm willing to hang on on the meeting. I think we have approximately 45 people uh, participating in the live stream. So as long as our uh, administrative panel is with us, we've got to get Ms. Harrington in here a little bit uh, and uh, Ms. Wagger. So let's let's keep rolling. All right. What is the pickup procedure if your child is not riding the bus? Okay, I think this will vary slightly by building. Uh, let's go around the horn. I tried to give Ms. Harrington a question. I don't think that this is a PPS question. This is a principal question. We'll start with Mr. Elvey. Sure. Um, so for our, our pickup procedure at DPS, um, uh, it'll be similar to, to what we did last year. We have a, uh, we'll have a, a faculty member outside uh, ready to sign, sign students out. Um, and once we have that, we're on the walkie talkies and we uh, will call that student to come directly to the car. Um, so we've, we've got a real nice procedure uh, where when our families roll in, as we start to learn of the families over the course of the year with our sign out, we know those families who, who come at pretty steady and it's a pretty quick sign out process. Uh, once our bell rings and we have everybody in, we, you know, we'll call into the to the lobby area. And then we'll have someone who's supervising the pickup children send those students out and we walk those children to their cars. Very good. Mrs. Squatchy. Sure. Our, our procedure is similar to DPS. We definitely stagger the student pickups um, from the bus. So we usually call the children down to the, the large gym and that's where we have them dismiss from to their parents' cars. This year I put out in our welcome back letter to parents if they could call Red Mill School or email our secretarial staff by September 1st to let us know if you plan on driving your child, that'll help us gauge a little um, tighter time frame as to what time the pickup will be. Last year, we had up to 100 um, parents initially driving their children to and from school. In the spring, as things got better, it went down to much less, about 75, and that was a nice relief for that traffic line and the, the long wait um, for the parents in the car at the end of the day. So we are encouraging our families to ride the bus as a safe and the most efficient means of getting their child to and from school each day. But um, in the event your comfort level um, is better suited to driving, we will give specific information about that via email from me prior to the start of school after we know exactly how many families we'll have in that line. Very good. Mr. Garib, Green Meadow. Yes, ours is very similar to uh, Red Mill's procedure. Uh, last year, thanks to the support of our superintendent, we had a uh, literally a new road built in the back of the school. Uh, By the so way, the name of that road is the Garib Lane. So just saying. <laughs> I was going to say Simon Street, but okay. uh, <laughs> um, so we've completely segregated the parent uh, pickup and drop off area uh, from the from the buses. Uh, like Mrs. Squalachi said, we've also asked our parents to uh, let our main office know, if possible, by September 1st, if you plan on transporting your child, although we would prefer that they take the bus uh, just to help us plan. Uh, entry into the building uh, this year will be nine o'clock. Uh, we're going back to our normal uh, start time. Uh, just to ensure that we have proper proper supervision of students uh, inside the building and the necessary time for our faculty and staff to uh, meet and get ready for the day. Um, if you have a second grader through a fifth grader, you stop at the uh, back wing and you let your child out where the temperature uh, screening will occur. If you have a kindergartner or a first grader, you continue up until the, uh, the gym. Uh, the pickup Again, similar to Red Mill, uh, we call our parent pickup students down to the gymnasium where they're seated uh, socially distanced. So we have a lot of staff and radios and uh, we've fine-tuned it, fine -tuned it quite a bit. So hopefully it'll go uh, even smoother. I just ask people to be patient and also be aware that we do have another school behind us, the Sackett Center. Uh, so be extra cautious. Uh, we Very also good. have the Skodak police on hand uh, when available. Excellent. And uh, as a reminder, uh, on our opening days and actually throughout the year, 
we're grateful for the support of law enforcement. They are out there in front of our schools and uh, primarily at um, entry time and dismissal time. We appreciate that support. Mr. Mahar. Yes, thank you, Mr. Simons. Um, what can I say? It's pretty much the same. Um, we, we call the students down, we have a clipboard, we check them off, we make sure the parents sign them out. This happens at the front entrance um, uh, before the buses line up in the parking lot because our, our location is a little different than some of the other schools. We can't have parent cars in, in the way. So um, it worked quite well for us. And incidentally, for mornings when parents are dropping students off, we use the door down by the our new parking lot that we have by the playground. And that also worked very well. We had uh, a member of the staff down there doing temperature check and greeting the parent in the parking lot and the student walked up the sidewalk. So we're gonna use the same procedure. The, the times will be pretty much the same. I'll put a notification out to parents before the start of school. Very good, Mr. Grignan. Thank you, Mr. Simons. Uh, similar to all the buildings, um, we're going to be, uh, Janae will be following a similar procedure. We will be calling our students down for the pickup procedure prior to dismissal to come down to the cafeteria, which is on the, um, the back end of Janae, right across from our playground, which is also where parents, if, you're, uh, if your child is uh, attending GCC in the morning or if you're pick being picked up, that's the same door that we'll be utilizing for parent pickup. Uh, we will be running two lanes, which worked really well for us to um, lessen the congestion on Route 4. Um, and um, as Mr. Alvey talked about, you know, the process at the beginning will be a little slower as we get to know you um, and uh, recognize you by face. It will speed up the process as we become more familiar with you. So that way that procedure will be uh, quicker as well. Very good. Um, while we're um looking for some additional questions to address. I'm going to put Ms. Harrington on the spot. Uh, Ms. Harrington will be assuming an interim role as the director of PPS uh, uh, for a short period of time. And I just will ask you to comment a little bit about, about some of the services that are available for families and or students who have uh, special education and or related services needs as we transition all of our students back. That's a very broad question. Uh, and I'm sorry that I put you on the spot, but I know we have families that uh, we serve who uh, may need uh, support and modifications uh, as we begin the school year. Yes, thank you. So as uh, students transition back, um, I know that we've added a lot of social work support just to start. So that's gonna be, um, I saw a question about reacclimation of full remote students. I think that yes. will be a support. Um, for students that are coming back into the school setting um, if they're struggling with that transition. So we will have a lot of extra social emotional support for students. Um, as far as the special education services, they'll look very similar to how they were delivered last year. Um, following all the safety protocols, um, they will be in you know, individual and small groups for their related services, um, such as speech, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. Um, they will also be following those safety protocols, making sure that um, there's, you know, sanitizing, cleaning, the students are socially distanced, um, wearing masks, obviously for speech and language um, with articulation um, services, the therapist will, um, you know, talk to the parent about how to best address that, whether they'll wear the mask or whether they will, you know, be six feet apart and one person will have the mask off in order to work on those um, uh, skills that they need to, and sounds they need to be working on. Um, you know, uh, as far as um, special classes, um, they will also be following all of the same safety protocols. Um, oftentimes, these classes are smaller size, so they can be even further socially distanced, um, sometimes six feet or maybe farther, um, because the class sizes are smaller. Any okay. other specific questions, Mr. Simons? Thank you, Ms. Harrington. I appreciate okay. that. It's very good. Very good. Um, let's have Ms. Cannon talk a little bit about, since Ms. Harrington brought up the extra supports, uh, Ms. Cannon, I know you have this committed to memory because you basically spent all summer hiring people to support the students. Can you give us a summary of the extra support staff, uh, teachers and support staff that we've added this year through our federal programs to support student success? Yes, thank you, Simons. We've added 10 K-3 
early intervention specialists, um, which will be assisting all of our elementary schools district wide. We also have 2.5 AIS teachers for the elementary school, 1.7 AIS teachers for the middle school, and we've hired um, two new social workers for the district, one um, that will be placed at Columbia High School, really focusing on mental health. We have another social worker that's gonna be district-wide assisting um, with our students and families, getting them ready to come back to the school year, um, helping us with um, transitioning our students back into an in-person setting. We also have um, a new counselor at the middle school, a CTAP we have at grade eight now. We just hired a new science teacher. And uh, we have about 15 new teaching assistants starting as well on August 31st. Um, some of them are gonna be assisting our learning resource centers. Um, others are gonna be assisting um, our K to five students. So uh, we've worked really hard uh, to put in as many supports as possible. And uh, we're, still, we're still actively uh, recruiting for um, more teaching assistants right now. Very good. So I'm going to now ask Ms. Wager, how did we do this, Ms. Wager? We didn't raise taxes. We had a 0% tax increase. And we announced last night at the board meeting that the tax rates in every municipality have gone down as a result of property values going up and equalization rates going down. So we've added all this staff. How are we doing that without breaking the budget? Thank you, Mr. Simons. Well, <laughs> We have taken a close look at our budget, um, but we are very fortunate in that we um, have federal funds available to us. Uh, the federal funds total a little over $7 million. So we are able to bring in a lot of um, services as well as additional furniture, equipment, uh, technology, um, upgrade to our systems that um, provide parents with an ability to apply for online free and reduced applications. Uh, we've also upgraded our TransFinder system to um, increase our bus ridership efficiency in the event that we need to do contact tracing. So there, there are multiple, multiple things that we're able to spend this money on. We're going to use this money through the next few years including summer school. The details of the information that Ms. Wagger just summarized are on the board agenda from last night's board meeting. So anyone can access that on our website. You can look at the expenditures associated with the extra staff, equipment and materials that we're providing. And if you have any questions or uh, ideas related to those uh, expenditures, you certainly can give either Ms. Wagger or myself a call or send us an email. How about one or two more questions and then we'll wrap up, Mr. Adam. All right. And you can also watch uh, the videos of all of our Board of Education meetings on our website. Those are posted there, including and, last night. And this meeting is being recorded. So if you have friends and family that have stu stu students in the district that were unable to participate in this meeting, they can still participate by watching the video at their convenience. I do appreciate, however, that you're participating live. Uh, this question is about reacclimation of full remote students from last year. My elementary school child has not been in their school building since March of 2020. This will be a big adjustment. So what efforts will we make uh, to make that an easier transition? We have had a number of conversations about the need to transition our full remote students back uh, to in-person learning, the extra support staff that we are providing along with the smaller class sizes that we have in most grade levels in most buildings this year are intended to provide the opportunity for more um, uh, you know, teacher contact time and supports for the kids. Additionally, we put in some new assessments to ensure that we have a good handle on your child's academic progress as they reacclimate to school and we'll be looking at that data to ensure that those services are deployed to help the kids adjust and to do well. We also, with the emphasis on our board, as we can within the parameters of health and safety, we plan to have fun activities social, to develop the uh, social relationships among the children, both with each other 
their peers in the classroom and with the adults in the school. So we uh, are cognizant of that. We will have opportunities for everybody to uh, slowly re-engage in the school and we have the supports in place to help your child do that. If there's a particular concern you have uh, regarding your child being able to adjust back to school, simply give your building principal a call. We'll take one more, Mr. Adam. We will be capturing these questions and putting out an FAQ at some point uh, so that everyone can uh, have the information. Last question is on testing. Will any of the testing conducted by the district be the more uncomfortable and invasive deep nasal test? How no. will that process work? Uh, no, uh, we are using the, uh, the antigen, Binax antigen uh, testing, which is a rapid test. It is a card test with a uh, small, uh, so it's not the deep nasal swab. Um, it is uh, not invasive and uh, we still haven't finalized the plan of how we would be doing that, uh, but we would be doing that with the um, antigen tests, which are the rapid tests. The deep nasal tests are considered to be the PCR test or the molecular tests. The type of tests that we're using are only valid for students and staff that are asymptomatic. If a child was, um, was uh, more symptomatic, we may need to refer that child for a different type of test. Um, and we're still discussing how that might work. There will be some information on the types of tests we're using and the testing plan as part of our opening plan posted on the website. This will be a regional document that we're still working on with the county. Okay, so I appreciate everybody going over time tonight. I particularly want to thank each and one, one of our administrators, along with Mr. Adam and Mr. Goodwin for assisting us with it, being able to connect with you. I think we got everybody in at least for one or two questions, and I appreciate everybody being available to help our parents understand the plans for September. I wanna thank parents for their patience and their support of their children and their support of our staff during what was a very difficult year last year. I'm looking forward with great optimism to September 9th when we welcome your children back to school for full in-person learning. Our staff will be making plans next week to ensure that we hit the ground running with celebration of the first day of school. And we look forward to partnering with you to ensure that we can provide the best education possible for each and every one of your children. We thank you for your support. We thank you for your interest in your child. We appreciate the two-way communication that you provided for us to make our children successful. And we look forward to a partnership that will continue to serve the community really well, celebrating the successes of your children as we move into a brand new school year. Thank you everybody for participating this evening. I wish everybody a continued good summer, with hopefully with not as much rain over the next two weeks before we begin and um, have a good evening. Thank you all.